The transition to menopause is a significant hormonal shift that marks each woman's life. And every journey is different depending on the individual's unique hormonal profile, health history, and wellness path. Along with the common vasomotor symptoms, women may also experience changes in arousal or desire and in their mental emotional wellness. What I teach is the cortisol oxytocin disconnection that happens as a result of post-traumatic stress. And if I haven't lived it, I wouldn't have seen it. And that's an important thing to understand because that's the physiology of burnout, the physiology of disconnect, and is the physiology of stress on our body. In this episode of Pathways to Wellbeing, we're going to discuss the intersection of menopausal hormonal changes and the mental emotional symptoms that can also occur during this transition. Joining us today is leading sexual health and menopause expert, Dr. Anna Kabeka, who will discuss her functional medicine approach to optimizing functional hormones and sexual health during the stages of menopause. Welcome, Dr. Kabeka. We're so excited to have you. It is great to be here with you. Thank you for having me to talk about this important topic. Well, we know that menopause represents this new chapter in life. And because of these complex hormonal processes that are taking place, it changes how we work with patients. I'm really excited to dive into this conversation today and and really understand how we can support this transition. I know you have a fascinating personal story that really guides your work and informs your passion for this field. And I thought it would be a good idea for us to start there. My goodness. Yeah. And I like how you say new chapter. I like to um, refer like the Japanese do to this stage of life as the second spring, right? Really uh, exemplifying that we've been through four seasons already. By the time you get to this age and stage in life, you've been through some hell. I mean, that's the truth of it, right? You have some you know, battle wounds, some good scars, and some uh, some really traumatic experience. So you have all of that, and so now it's in it's a time of rebirth and re um, newing yourself because just like puberty is natural and mandatory, and that everyone will go through it, so is menopause for women. Every woman will experience menopause at some time or another, and so natural and mandatory however suffering is optional and this is why it's so important to get to the core reasons like why you know what's going on here why is it harder for some women and and seemingly easier for others and what do we need to do as the provider as the the practitioner to help them navigate this important time and I will share my personal story because I'm, a, you know, an Emory trained OBGYN and I um, didn't learn any of this in residency. Um, I went into solo practice in Southeast Georgia and I was there for 22 years and now I'm in Dallas, Texas. But my journey has taken me literally around the world looking for answers to my own health crisis, which occurred in 2006 after the tragic loss of our son, Garrett, in a tragic accident. He was only a toddler. And um, from that point on, you know, our lives never, you know, changed completely and the grief and the trauma and the PTSD, I mean, the post-traumatic stress um, is, you know, his life and his, his, his short, sweet life and, um, and this experience has has taught us all as a family so much um and you know and and that's one of the reasons i um, do what i do as a mission to help others not struggle like i struggled when i didn't have anyone guiding me and what happened post-traumatically is that i went into i was infertile at that point my husband at the time and i wanted so hard badly to have another child Uh, not to replace our son, but to be part of our family and to continue to grow our family and to fill some of our hole that we had in our hearts. And then um, I was diagnosed with infertility. I failed round after round of the highest injectable doses of fertility treatments with zero to minimal ovarian response. And I was told by my colleagues in reproductive endocrinology that my only opportunity would be through egg donation, which wasn't a decision my husband and I wanted to make and literally devastated. And then after that, after those rounds and rounds, um, being then diagnosed with early menopause, being completely amenorrheic, early menopause, infertile, as the OBGYN having helped so many women 
you know, uh, get pregnant and deliver beautiful babies and then to really struggle with this at 39 years old at that time at 39 years old. And um, I tried everything. My doctor's bag was empty. And I know many practitioners listening at the here are going to have experienced that too. Many of you listening may have been triggered with what I just shared with you. And I acknowledge that each of our pains, our grief, our experience in life can't be compared to another. There are ours to own and, um, you know, to honor however we choose to do that. So I acknowledge you for that. So in this journey, I, I literally um, took a sabbatical from my practice. A doctor um, had a, a physician, Dr. Deborah Shepard, an OBGYN, came and took over my practice for a year. She was an angel sent by God, I have no doubt. And from that journey, I traveled around the world looking for answers on part of our own healing journey. Um, and, you know, to, to not live the same life over and over again and the same grief that we were living over and over again. But I always say I went around the world to learn what the Buddhists say that um, everywhere you go, there you are. <laughs> so remembering that we have to deal with our spiritual, mental, physical, psychological aspects of our health. And, um, and part of that journey, I've reversed with God's grace, reversed early menopause, and naturally became pregnant with the child I was told I would never be able to have, and that is Ava Marie who um, I delivered at age 41, and she is now 15. And on the weekends, I haul horses in a big old dude truck pulling a 33 foot horse trailer, <laughs> because I am devoted to her. And, um, and it's been part of that journey, reversing menopause, learning these tools, learning these skills and the lifestyle medicine that I evolved with over time, because that opened my mind to the possibility of what could be. What, early menopause at 39 and, and you're gonna tell me that I can reverse that? Unheard of, right? And we don't say that in gynecology and obstetrics. Sorry, here's, you know, here's some hormones, here are the birth, here's the birth control pills and, you know, at, at, you know, sometime in your 50s we'll take you off of them. No, I mean, that's, that's the treatment, right? That's, and many of you are nodding your head. Yep, my patients have been told the same thing. Same thing through menopause. I mean, I consulted with clients this week that, you know, we're told the same things. And so uh, it can, can be very frustrating. But the good news is that you're here, you're learning functional medicine, and there's answers. There's answers to this approach. And what I went on to discover is, you know, that it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones, number one. And I wrote my first book. It's called The Hormone Fix, mandatory reading for y'all. I don't know if they warned you, but I'm giving you mandatory re reading. <laughs> So the hormone fix, and it's a great book for your patients too. And um, it is it is that this piece, part of my journey and how I evolved to do what I do, what I call the keto green lifestyle and the girlfriend doctor methodology and hormone restoration, all of these things is pretty much without a prescription pad and a surgical knife. So we can come at it many ways. That is an incredible personal testimonial to functional medicine. And not only am I so touched by your journey, but it, it's also making me think about, especially for those who might be new to functional medicine, we get so excited. We learn the functional medicine matrix, right? So we create this map of our body systems. We think I've got all of these body systems covered, but at the center of the matrix is the mental, emotional, spiritual component. And these pieces I'm starting to pick from your story is we absolutely have to consider the mental, emotional, spiritual health of our patients. It is a vital role in their health trajectory. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this is the, the piece that's so important that we understand and we teach our, our patients. It's like, just like you can't get well in the same environment you got sick in, you know, really addressing the, the trauma, the understanding physiology of that trauma. And so what I teach is the cortisol oxytocin disconnection that happens as a result of post-traumatic stress. And if I hadn't lived it, I wouldn't have seen it. And that's an important thing to understand because that's the physiology of burnout, the physiology of disconnect, and is the physiology of stress on our body. And, um, you know, and, and I think it's so important uh, as a provider to recognize that, to be able to see when that's happening physiologically to a client, because it's going to throw all the hormones awry when you're in that um, state, either chronic everyday stress, post-traumatic stress, adverse childhood experiences. And in the time of menopause, 
they it like comes to a head i call like our pressure you know sometimes we have a pressure cooker of a life and then the lid to that pressure cooker cooker is progesterone so you take off that lid of progesterone because progesterone is plummeting you know mid to late 30s at, and into our 40s and 50s so that protective neuroprotective hormone progesterone decreases so now you've got like that's the lid to your pressure cooker so now you're just like exploding with emotions hot flashes all the neuroendocrine sy symptoms that our patients come to us about right well you mentioned that you started having menopausal symptoms when you were i think you said 39 right so there's definitely this difference between physiological ovarian aging and pathological ovarian aging. Will you talk to us a little bit about when the menopause transition is considered healthy and when we might think oh, this is, this is now a dysfunctional pattern? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think um, we, we were taught, you know, spare off endocrinology, one of our um, OBGYN textbooks that menopause age 52 plus or minus, you know, a few years. And in smokers, it's 42. And endometriosis, we know it's earlier too. So in cases of inflammation, right? Inflammation, stress to our body, we're gonna see earlier in menopause. That's all pathologic. Um, you know, and early premature ovarian menopause has the immunologic component to it. But I would say that we're seeing if a patient's coming to you with symptoms anytime in their 30s and 40s, like that's when you start acting, right? You start acting by detoxing their liver and empowering their adrenal glands so they can start using their hormones better. And like for me, it's the keto green lifestyle. You eliminate sugar, you intermittent fast, give your body time to heal itself. You alkalinize the diet and the mindset with oxytocin increasing activities, the most powerful and alkalinizing hormone of our body. You do those four things and all of a sudden you, you patients come back in within a, a few weeks and they're like, I feel 100% better. And that's because we've now empowered the body, supported the glandular system, supported the adrenals, supported the ovaries to do what it's designed to do into our 50s. And as a result of my journey, that early menopause that I was reversed in 39, um, I was great till about 48. And that's when I experienced all those secondary, <laughs> a second menopause. So weight gain, despite not doing anything different, I'm telling you, my patients would come in and tell me that I'd be like, yeah, sure, you're not. You're ex I'm sure you're exercising less. Let me look in your purse. Is there a snicker bar in there? What's going on? And um, but that weight gain without doing anything different and um, and the night sweats, the hot flashes, the difficulty sleeping, the loss in sex drive. So that hit me again at 48. And so that's when I really dug in, dug into a ketogenic lifestyle and then recognized for women, we need the alkalinizing component. So hence my keto green uh, way of doing things. And and it's a lot of what I teach now as part of the lifestyle and um, the nutrition that um, is empowering in menopause and beyond. And that helps with the ovarian resuscitation, that helps with the adrenal gland resuscitation. So now we've just empowered our organs to do more of what we need to do. And then I use adaptogens. I use um, my Mighty Maca Plus, which has maca and 30 superfoods combined, and we've seen improvements in DHEA and progesterone. So that's an adaptogenic blend that works really well that can do. And if we need to further on, we'll add progesterone, estrogen, uh, DHEA, and those other additional hormones, but you've got to support detox and you've got to support regeneration. I'm feeling very excited to take a deep dive into these nutrition and lifestyle interventions. But before we do that, I think if we're seeing patients in the clinic, we might be wondering, okay, how do I identify the patient persona who maybe is losing some ovarian resiliency at an accelerated pace. So let's talk a little bit about menopause specific concerns because we have the, the vasomotor symptoms and we have changes in mood and energy. And I think we might be able to anticipate some of those, but are there symptoms that are maybe less intuitive or we might not initially associate them with menopause, but we should be thinking about this. Yeah, definitely. And it's so funny because I'm like, you know, I've been singing, you know, divorced for 11 years now. Again, I didn't learn this whole cortisol, oxytocin disconnect thing in time, but um, 
and that that uh, dating in my fifties and talking to other, you know, to to my dates, and they'll be like, "Oh, my my wife was bipolar." I've heard that enough times to recognize they were not bipolar; they were hormonal. They were hormonal. So one of those symptoms are those definite those mood swings. You have you have fatigue, you have mood swings, you have forgetfulness, brain fog, uh, insomnia heart palpitations, muscle aches, stiffness in your joints, bladder incontinence, decrease in orgasm, restless leg syndrome, hair loss, all of those are other symptoms that especially the heart palpitations. I mean, how many of our patients have ended up in the emergency room with palpitations when it's probably progesterone and magnesium? And when you add that back in, wow, it's like, that's such an improvement. So th those are very common during this time. So with this huge variety and spectrum of symptoms that we might witness, are there some tools and biomarkers that you're using to help your patients understand what stage of life they're in hormonally? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's a piece of this. Like when we're experiencing these symptoms is, you know, tests don't gas. What gets measured gets managed. In my book, The Hormone Fix, chapter two is that test don't gas. So it has our inventories, the MSQ inventory from functional medicine, medical symptom questionnaire, my own hormone toxicity uh, um, questionnaire inventory. Also, what key lab tests? So questions we answer, I will say treat the patient, not the labs, but those labs are really good markers for us. And I go through, you know, we can do a lot, we can spend a lot of money in functional medicine labs. I know y'all are like, yeah, we can. And I've gone the gamut from, again, having very high-end clients that want everything done, and then from having very um, economically um, restricted clients that we needed to just focus on, what are the key things? And that's where I really got thinking. What are the key tests that I need for this client to really motivate them to make changes and see changes very quickly? And it really comes down to four key tests that I want to look at and watch and monitor over time in the in the the fewest that I can do. And of course, number one is a vitamin D 25 hydroxy. Without vitamin D, our progesterone doesn't work well. Our oxytocin doesn't work well. I mean, vitamin D is important and pretty much, you know, most of our hormone receptor sites for our reproductive hormones to work well, we need healthy levels of vitamin D. And many of us don't realize that as, as prescribers. It's in the research though, and it's been there for quite a long time. The second one I test regularly is an inflammatory marker, HSCRP. HSCRP is a key inflammatory marker, so the highly sensitive or cardio C-reactive protein. And when I started checking this in my practice, it was crazy the things I would recognize. I mean, I would see clients would come in with an HSCRP. I had one woman, she came in with a complaining of everything, had been to her cardiologist, her internist, her family physician, her podiatrist, had all these other doctors. She came in to me for, to see me for her pap smear and she had all these symptoms. I said, well, let me, you mind if I look at the labs you've had done? And so of course they didn't have uh, HSCRP or you know, many of the labs that we want. So I did one. And it was 111. And this woman, you know, was um, dead six months later. She had metastatic cancer. So did I do her a favor or not? I don't know. But, you know, if we found that earlier, man, we could have turned that around. We could have turned that around. So I think it's really important to watch these inexpensive markers. The third test that I like to do is the DHEAS, the marker of our adrenal status in the blood. Again, quick and expensive, and we can see how well are our adrenals working. When we're high under under stress, often they're very, those levels are very low, but we want to see what they're doing over time. And sometimes they come in and they're way too high, they're out of balance, but mostly we see them and they're way too low, especially in women over 40. And so we want to look at that level and see what we can do to optimize it with the supplement I talked about my mighty maca plus we will see a 70 to 200% increase in DHEA and adrenal function in two to three months, so we will see that improvement it's important again to when you're giving your clients something they're paying money for you want to see those numbers improve. And the fourth test is the hemoglobin a1c. 
So of course we want to get that number as low as we can get it, you know, around below 5, 5.0, 4.8. We want to see that good hemoglobin A1C drop, and we can actually see it drop very quickly. If you've got a cantankerous patient and like, you know, two months out, you know, they're not going to wait two months to see a change. You can actually, if you've like, we've put clients in the keto green lifestyle rechecked in one month. And we've seen hemoglobin A1Cs drop from 6 to 5.4. I mean, technically, that's unheard of, right? We always wait two months. But we've seen it over and over again. So I think those are four key markers. I probably add um, and give credit to Dr. Perlmutter, this fifth one, uric acid level. Um, and I think many of us um, don't realize, especially in doing a keto uh, a lifestyle or keto green lifestyle, or if we're playing with carnivore or extended fasting, that those of us with a metabolic or genetic predisposition will make a lot of uric acid and that puts us into a metabolic slowdown. So it's important to watch that one too. Such good and helpful takeaways in terms of lab evaluation. So let me ask you this question. You've, you've mentioned inflammation as a driver for hormonal dysfunction. Let's say a patient comes in, their high sensitivity C-reactive protein is elevated. Do you find that when you start to address that underlying inflammation, that their menopausal symptoms naturally improve? Absolutely. Absolutely. I said that two key reasons for over 90 uh, percent of our illnesses are hormone imbalance and inflammation. You add in adrenal dysfunction and you've got 99.9 percent. .9%. So address those three things and you've empowered them to heal. And um, yeah, that's powerful. Very powerful. You mentioned a DHEA sulfate. Is there a role for any cortisol assessment in this workup? Yeah. Again, when you're working with clients, I think it's important to stay, you know, assess what they need at the beginning. Because again, like I said, I've I even created testing, full testing pa panels for women, including organic acids and essential fatty acids and ADMA. I mean, boy, we can get into it, right? And so, and then, believe me, I want to see all of that. Um, so the four point salivary cortisol is very beneficial. Urinary hormone testing, especially hormone metabolites, to see again how that's changing with time, especially if you're manipulating their hormones. It's important to look at those things too. And um, nutritional assessments and you know, of course, digestive health and stool analysis are critical to the overall health of our patient. But you wanna again figuring out because we, we just mentioned a couple thousand dollars worth of testing right there. You want to figure out what do you need when like what are the biggest changes you can make now what do you need to motivate the client where do you want to see them out what do you where do you want to fine-tune them next um, i've made the mistake early on of like think okay you need these 11 prescriptions or whatever or these 11 supplements it's no no better than prescribing someone 11 drugs right you gotta get a balance that out with what you want to do and um, sometimes we do have to be very aggressive very quickly but oftentimes we can take, we can take, I say, the seasonal approach. I really admire this um, stepwise, like a first tier lab ordering, and then we escalate from there. I think that's really using labs diligently. Uh, one more question before we move on, because it's just so interesting to hear your perspective. You said that uh, a hemoglobin A1C is part of your workup. Are you finding that maybe your patients have had a normal hemoglobin A1C their entire life, then they enter this menopausal transition. Now, all of a sudden, they're struggling with glu uh, glucose regulation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely a part of this entire journey. And what's interesting, when we look at the research um, published looking at women who have had hysterectomies, and there's a, a, a published study not too long ago, and it looked at women with hysterectomies and women who had um, a hysterectomy and their ovaries removed. So, uh, you know, TAH, BSO, or you know, bilateral salpingo ophorectomy, so immediate menopause. And what it showed that women who um, just average, no intervention had, you know, a in, in menopause had a significant increase in risk of diabetes. Um, but if you've had a hysterectomy, that risk was even higher. And if you've had your ovaries removed, your risk is even higher. So like did a TAH, did a hysterectomy and removal of the ovaries or, you know, cause that um, increase in diabetes? Or was it the dysfunctional glucose regulation that caused the dysfunctional bleeding and the need for the hysterectomy to begin with? I would vote on the latter. So you fix that issue and guess what? They don't need a hysterectomy. And I, and I did this in my practice. And so 
I was, you know, I, I trained at Emory and I loved my training and I love surgery. I love that quick fix. And as I got more in tune with, you know, hormonal management and functional medicine and integrative medicine, um, where I used to do two to three surgeries a week in, a, in doing this approach, which I call my keto green, uh, you know, approach, my detox, um, I went from doing two to three surgeries a week to needing to do two to three major surgeries per year. And those were usually in clients that came in and were too far gone and I wasn't able to reverse their, their symptoms or their, their pathology. But in general, I could reduce their need for a hysterectomy by over 90%. Well, I know everyone listening at this point wants to know more about this keto green lifestyle. Will you tell us what that means? So the keto green lifestyle, and it's what I call it, right? Because uh, when I was going through my second menopause, let's say at 48, and I gained that 20 pounds that without doing anything different, I was terrified because I'd once been well over 240 pounds, had lost 80 pounds, and it was pretty good at keeping that off, 70, 80 pounds off. And, um, and then I was experienced that 20 pound weight gain and anyone who's lost a significant amount of weight, when you see that happening, you're like, oh, it's not going to stop till I'm 300. What is going on here? And so I had a daughter, <clears throat> I have a daughter who has seizures. So I was already very familiar with, thanks to Dr. Catherine Wilmer. Thank you. Shout out to um, her epic history and functional medicine, but with the keto diet. So from early 2000s, and so I was familiar with it and I used it in my neurologic patients. I used a modified keto approach in my candida patients. And so anyway, so I'm using it myself at this point. I'm like, I'm not gonna eat another carb. I can't let the scale move up, you know, one more notch at all. And I felt like I hit a wall. I didn't like how I felt. And I did what I tell my patients to do, check your urine pH. And I was, my urine pH was as acidic as the pH paper read. So and I think the minimum was five. So who knows? I mean, like I was peeing battery acid at that point. And that's important because men and women do keto differently. Men have 10 times as much testosterone, our anabolic steroid, right? Women don't. And so, you know, we're gonna get into a catabolic state, a breakdown state a lot sooner than men, especially doing keto. And so adding that now the keto world says, okay, add minerals, add minerals. And, and so for me, it was adding alkalinizers. This is back in um, 2014, I was adding alkalinizers. I was adding the greens and the low carbohydrate greens, like the kale, the beet greens, the sprout, the cruciferous vegetables for hormone balancing. And I started playing with the chemistry of food and working and trying to maintain that ketogenic lifestyle. And as my urine pH got more alkaline it, and I stayed in ketosis at the same time, quite a challenge, which I challenge everyone here to do. And, um, and I, uh, you know, I felt like, you know, it says in the Bible, the peace that surpasses all understanding, nothing in my crazy outer world had changed, but I was better. I felt better. The weight came off. My moods were better. My memory cleared. I've since authored three best selling books. Couldn't have done that before this time. In that, in this physiology, I can talk to you clearly. I can present. I can write. That keto alkaline state is really important to bump into that on a periodic basis. So that's part of the keto green way with intermittent fasting. So I, I tell my clients for women, I, I have recognized that it's often, again, depends. Everyone's different. And I recommend you try what works best for you and then keep changing stuff. Um, so the, you know, breaking fast. So it's intermittent fasting, breaking fast at 10 a.m. So approximately 16 hours between dinner and breakfast, start at 13, work your way up to 16 and 16 hours of intermittent fasting. And then say, for example, breakfast is a smoked salmon with um, olive oil, onions, capers, uh, some arugula and, you know, and, you know, again, drizzled with olive oil. I mean, it's just amazing. So, and some sea salt on there, that's a perfect keto green breakfast. And your blood sugar, and I wore it for my second book, Keto Green 16, I work in 2015, 20, sorry, 2018, 19, I wore a continuous glucose monitor the entire time. So I made sure that my blood sugar didn't elevate with those re the new recipes I was creating as well as the old ones. And so, you know, the um, you want to keep a, a breakfast when you break fast like that, healthy fats, high quality proteins, low alkalinizing carbs. 
you your blood sugar stays stable and you're not hungry so you can have two meals a day you can have you know two three meals no snacking no more snacking for you know there's very few reasons if ever to snack only if you want to so but physically for health there's very few reasons so um so that's part of the lifestyle you you have a um i usually say uh, an eight hour eating window, but you can shorten it and extend it to, again, to have that flexibility, that variety. And say dinner is a stir fry, some stir fried vegetables with, um, you know, I like steak, so steak or some seafood or um, yeah, buffalo meat and ground meat and add in some great flavors. I use a lot of herbs and spices, seven spices, all spice. Poivre aromatique is another great, it makes everything taste better. And, um, and that would be a, a really healthy dinner. And then, you know, drinking in between your meals, not with your meals, so you don't dilute your digestive enzymes. And then having a good evening ritual so that you're, um, you know, really getting to deep restorative sleep at night. Part of the keto green lifestyle is positive mental attitude, practice of gratitude, intermittent fasting, making sure you're getting healthy fats, high quality protein, enough protein, and the alkalinizing vegetables and fermented foods to support your gut and um, detoxification pathways, and then enough time for your body to rest and digest. So that's part of what is the keto grain lifestyle. Well, that sounds lovely to me. Are you using this plan mostly with women who are in their menopausal transition? I can see how there might be benefit for PCOS and Absolutely. other metabolic situations as well. What's your ideal candidate for this type of nutritional yeah. plan? Well, I think the biggest thing is if it works for a woman in menopause, because we are difficult, it works for everyone. And that's what we found. We've run groups. Dr. Angela Aki out of uh, Gainesville, Florida has run since the, you know, 2020, like at the, through before and through the pandemic. I think we had one keto green group go before the pandemic. And then we were virtual after the pandemic started, but we were able to look at our two groups before the pandemic. So we were able to look at labs and have people doing it together, you know, uh, husbands, wives, um, families all doing it together. And certainly in my family that we've all done it, you know, most of us will stay, you know, bump in and out of it periodically, but all ages are, I mean, it's again, it's good whole foods and that is good for any age and reducing sugar intake is really powerful. Well, as we're talking about all of these lifestyle factors, we know that the incidence of early onset menopause is increasing and that there's some thought and some research that's pointing to endocrine disrupting chemicals and estrogen mimetics. Are there some other precipitating factors that you're thinking about? I'm, I feel certain that there's a lifestyle component here. Oh yeah, absolutely. Certainly it's the higher glycemic food, but the endocrine disruptors are huge. And, and many that we haven't even had control over what's in our water, what's in our air, what's in our you know, the umbilical cord blood uh, during pregnancy. I mean, all of those things we have exposure to. It's really important to understand that and to minimize, reduce exposure as much as possible in our, in our food system, right? The food we eat, um, you know, it, it matters what they ate and how they were, what they were injected with and how they were treated, all of those things. So we look at the life force continuum cycle. All that's powerful. Stress is one of the biggest physiologic shifters in in hormonal health that i've seen though well you've given us so many ideas to treat not only a, a menopausal transition that we would expect but also a premature hormonal transition so my question this is maybe the most loaded question of the episode can we reverse premature menopause i did for me i did for me and i have in several of my clients and and you know, I think hopefully countless more. So in my community, in my girlfriend doctor community, we've had clients that hadn't had a period for three, four years and start having periods again. And that's a hallelujah moment. You know, once we rule out, like I'm my gynecologist, and once we rule out any endometrial issues or varying issues, we've done a pelvic ultrasound and an endometrial biopsy, then we can say hallelujah, we've just reversed aged you a decade. And that is powerful. So being able to do ovarian resuscitation, I mean, that type, this type of practice through diet and lifestyle and adaptogens and supplements, and maybe we're using some peptides too. I mean, these things can really, really help. And yes, I've seen it reverse. And, um, and we, you know, and we've seen, you know, spontaneous pregnancies in the, 
you know, in their later 40s when they weren't expecting it. <laughs> Some were very happy. <laughs> I think most were. <laughs> but, um, you know, be prepared, right? You cannot. Um, and so it's fascinating, right? These things make a difference. And I'll give you an example for the guys out there that are listening and are caring about their women's health, but also just in general for male fertility factor. So we have a case where a guy was infertile for you know much of his adult life, went through fertility treatments, was told he had low sperm count, and um, you know is single, enjoying his single lifestyle, and um, and so he um, during the pandemic he's like I'm going to get healthy, he's upping his vitamin D, his vitamin C, his zinc, and lo and behold he and now is a father of two children, and he is 48 years old, and he was for 20 years with diagnosed low sperm count. So the supplements that we do can really affect our fertility and the lifestyle, right? Choosing to be healthy, choosing to pass the alcohol, you know, pass by the alcohol, pass, you know, really support our body's own natural hormonal regeneration. I mean, that's powerful for our body. So it's something that should be done um, as part of wanting to age gracefully. Well, I think this really goes back how you said when we start optimizing all of our body systems, it gives us hope. We're turning over stones that no one has turned over before. And I think that that's a great example of that point. Yeah. <laughs> and then that and then gets me onto a tirade, like, what are you doing not using a condom anyway? <laughs> and first of all, ladies, why aren't you demanding it? And secondly, you know, do you really want to swap microbiome with someone like that now? <laughs> We'll be careful who we share our microbiome with. That is right. That is right. <laughs> well, I think related to the functional medicine matrix, we talked about the center of that matrix, which is the mental, emotional, spiritual concerns. And during menopause, we've covered so many of the physiological changes, but there's also this mental, emotional shift. And we mentioned at the beginning of the episode that sometimes that affects our sexuality, our libido, our arousal. You even mentioned our ability to orgasm. What are some of the underlying factors that might impair our sexual function, make us feel disconnected from our partner? Yeah, so that's really great. Definitely the cortisol oxytocin connection disconnect, right? So when you're in this state when, you know, like when cortisol's high, oxytocin goes low. Because like when you're in fight or flight, it's not the time to, you know, stop and hug your neighbor, right? You're not gonna hug your enemy. You're in this stress state, makes sense, right? Cortisol goes up, oxytocin goes down. That's the hormone of connection. And when it's up, when cortisol is up for a long time, like our paraventricular nucleus in the brain will shut down that that production of cortisol. So now you're in this dangerously, this dangerous space where cortisol and oxytocin are both low. So that's going to create that disconnect. That also that low libido. It's not the time for reproduction. It's you know more associated with infertility during that time. So. Um, so, you know, decreased fertility at least, right? And so that's, that's important physiologic. And as our, you know, progesterone starts to decline, that's our mother hormone. So from, from there we'll derive DHEA and then from there estrogen and testosterone, more of the reproductive hormones. When we're in stress, we're producing less of those reproductive hormones, so less desire, right? Let, we're in fight, flight, or free state. And, and I will say flight is that escape. I, I want to escape my work. I want to escape my family. I want to escape my country, whatever. When you're feeling those things, that's physiologic. And our physiology affects our behavior, our mental health and mental well-being. And in my in one of the areas, I lecture on sexual health all the time. And I say this low, this low um, sex drive comes from really three areas we have to investigate. The first is desire. Why is desire low? The second is disconnect. You know, that sense it's physiologic disconnect. You're not connected. You're not getting along. You're not going to want to make love. You're not going to want to have sex. When you're in that disconnected state, you're not going to want to do the things you enjoy doing. And, and oxytocin is low. It's actually the time when you really need to be doing those things. And the third is um, discomfort. If you have discomfort every time you do something, if you have pain every time you do something, why would you want to? Early in my gynecologic career, I had a patient come to me, actually back in 1999, so way back. She came to me and she said, Dr. Anna, I have been diagnosed with ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. My husband and I have been married for 28 years, and I am a woman of the 60s. I want to have sex. It hurts every time I do. I'm dry. No doctor will even give me estrogen, and I'd rather die than live this way. 
And she's like, help me. And I was like, oh, shit, I got to help you. I was straight out of residency. I'm like, well, what's in my doctor's bag? I didn't have anything in my doctor's bag. So that led me in this field of sexual medicine and understanding, well, what's the research say? Yes, we can use vaginal and topical estrogen. Yes, we can use DHEA and testosterone. We should be able to use these things because from a mecha, you know, from safety profiles in the breast tissue, it's not gonna, if, if anything, it will help, not hurt. And then, then of course, I'm like, I have to consent you out the yin yang. If you want to try this, you know, I'm going to consent you and you're fully owning the, you know, risks and, uh, you know, potential risk and complications of this therapy, as well as acknowledging that there's going to be tremendous benefit. So, um, so that's where I really started looking at androgen prescribing and especially with DHEA very safely in the US it's over the counter. Um, I created a cosmetic cream. So topical for clitoris to anus because people forget about the clitoris and you cannot because it is number one pleasure area on a woman's body and it's important it will atrophy and shrink as we get older unless we keep it nourished and rejuvenated and we do that with hormone and pelvic floor exercises and attention right. So, and then all the way, the vulvar tissue and vaginal tissue, these topical hormones can absorb into the vaginal tissue because it's so vascular. So we reverse vaginal atrophy. And I have a client who's been using my product for a long time because when I stopped, when I closed my medical practice, I stopped prescribing. Um, and then when I moved to Texas, I didn't get my Texas license. I've been on on a, a hiatus, but I, I wanted way back in 2015 to create something over the counter that was better than anything I could write on a prescription pad. So women didn't have a barrier to be able to use, um, you know, something like this. So I created the first vulvar cosmetic cream. And, um, and then don't forget the anal tissue, anal fissures, hemorrhoids, very common. I see this often in the, my gynecologic practice. So, you know, being able to use it clitoris to anus is really very important. And, um, and so that's topical DHA, very safe. The work of Ferdinand Labrie out of Montreal, had, he's been studying this for two decades now. It's really powerful, good and safety studies. The work of Rebecca Glazer, some of her testosterone research, you know, gave me some confidence to be able to play at least with DHA and then I added plant stem cells to my formula, but it's important to use this because if you have pain every time you do something, why would you want to? As patients told me, Dr. Anna, you know, I, um, you know, I, I just power through because I know I'm supposed to as a wife or I'm supposed to enjoy it or after, you know, like a few times or a few dates, I'm drying up and it's, you know, some, something wrong with me. Am I broken? I'm like, oh, we can, re we can reverse that. And I have a patient, as I started to mention, who's been with me um, using my product since um, it came out. And she's 67 years old now. And she's like, she is very proud to tell everyone she has the vagina of a 25-year-old. And I say there is no better anti-aging marker than that. <laughs> So pay attention. I mean, you can reverse that, the aging of that vaginal tissue. And with that, you in, you're going to enjoy sex more and you have more oxytocin, more pleasure, less incontinence, be able to run, jump on a trampoline, enjoy activities, go out on a boat for six, eight hours and not worry that you're going to have an accident. I mean, things like that, that have limited the lifestyle of, of you know women through through the ages but especially menopause and beyond and we don't want to have limitations we want to be limitless to the best of our ability limitless really improving quality of life and letting your patients return to doing the things that they love and gives them meaning and purpose i think that's beautiful so it sounds like you're using topical hormones for the most part and menopausal hormone replacement therapy i think remains somewhat controversial is there a role or how are you utilizing oral hormones? Is that coming into play in your practice as well? Yeah. So, and this is an area too. I've, um, um, I, you know, I really do think that hormones, you know, is particularly progesterone with or without a uterus into, you know, post-menopause is really important tool for us to use and not be afraid of using it. Progesterone is a neuroprotective hormone that topically or orally has, is not associated with any complications. You got to watch the dosages you're using. I use topical progesterone and pregnenolone in a lot of my clients and definitely post, you know, post and during menopause and beyond. I think it's key again, with or without a uterus, it's so important to balance the hormones. 
And um, DHEA, testosterone, estrogen. Now the question is oral versus transdermal. And that's a really good question. The safest route we go is transdermal. There are benefits early, you know, for oral estrogen, but you know, typically I don't keep anyone on oral estrogen past age 55 because of its pro-inflammatory um, reaction. It'll cause an increase in HSCRP and we've seen it. So switching to transdermal, you completely, you know, avoid that risk or complication at all. And so I think that's where like we have to get comfortable prescribing hormones, you know, postmenopausally. And I, I like to customize. So when I work or consult or do physician to physician consultations, we talk about customizing hormonal care. So using topicals or trochees. Now trochees, uh, that's that oral transdermal trans, you know, it, you're getting some orally with that troche. So you get, you know, pay attention to that too. Watch the HSCRP if you're using a troche. The benefit of using the troche is that, um, so it's like a lozenge that dissolves between the cheek and gum. And you can, you know, periodically once or twice a week, use that same dose troche intravaginally and keep the, give that added boost to the vagina. So you're, as physicians, you can prescribe that way it's like a little bonus from that trochee and then and transdermal uh, creams as well and being able to use them in different different areas in your body and um you know and and customize that care and i you know i've i've dug into this because i really work hard to empower my patients to take you know with the guidance of a good physician um to be empowered to make those decisions what you know what's the best diet and lifestyle what's the best um you know workout regimen i may have to change it up a few times right what's the uh supplements that we need to use or you know cycle in and cycle out of and what's the hormonal therapy that's the best hormonal therapy what else can i do to support aging gracefully that's going to honor my body's own ability to make hormones versus suppress them and i think that's those are the key things that i want practitioners prescribers to really recognize when we're using um, hormonal therapies too especially well this is personalized precision medicine at its best and now we've talked about lifestyle factors we've talked about hormone replacement therapy i cannot let this time go by without talking to you about oxytocin because you've mentioned this a few times and it seems that this is a therapy that we can use to help ease the transition and really empower our patients in their sexuality will you just give us a brief primer of how you're using or supporting oxytocin in practice yeah, certainly the oxytocin is free. You make it naturally and you want to keep making it, right? So, but this is the this is the interesting. Again, I have a full chapter on this in my book, The Hormone Fix. But the the thing is with oxytocin, so naturally you increase it by, you know, making love, having orgasms, hugging, kissing, laughing. So I always prescribe my clients my big fat Greek wedding, that is like the best oxytocin increasing movie there is, right? So, so something like that, you know, and then playing, having a pet, playing with a pet, doing things you enjoy doing, gratitude, charity, giving, all of those things increase oxytocin. Sometimes when you've had post trauma, when you've had trauma, like I've had trauma, you know, many listeners here, or patients have had trauma, then you have uh, decreased levels of DMT, you have decreased uh, levels of oxytocin. So you want to really make that when you don't feel like making oxytocin, you need to make that a habit. So things that can help improve uh, oxytocin naturally are certainly, you know, again, the like for me, that's why the keto green diet and lifestyle is built around certain foods like the fermented foods and things that we know that can help, uh, you know, nourishing our body, our brain, et cetera, and possibly increase our oxytocin in those ways. And also, um, um, things like if we need to prescribe oxytocin again like anything else if we are prescribe it daily long term you're going to suppress the body's own ability to make oxytocin so we don't want to do that so prescribe it in a pulsatil as needed basis but for many of my clients have burnout exhausted they're struggling with work and they're coming home from work exhausted i have an er physician and she would come home from the er totally exhausted her teenage children you know, like they, she, she said, I had zero at the door, opening the door. I had zero to give my children. 
And so we worked on all of these things, but in the meantime, I, I gave her oxytocin. So I would prescribe it in a trochee and I would give it to her um, to have to take on the way home from work. So, and, you know, to work on a meditation, listen to great music, do these other things to increase her oxytocin by the time she got to the door. As we worked on, again, decreasing cortisol, because you can imagine how stressful an ER position is, but so many of us experience it in other ways. And work to regulate her cortisol and naturally get her body to start making more oxytocin again too. So there are ways we can prescribe it and not to be afraid of doing it, but to pay attention to that. Um, God, I can go, I can give a five hour lecture on oxytocin. Well, I can sense your passion for this subject. And Dr. Kabeka, I just wanted to thank you so much for sharing all of these insights. You have filled our toolbox with so many strategies to support menopausal health, hormonal health, sexual health. We so admire your work. Thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I just let a note, you know, that I will be doing a hormone research, uh, replenishment certification program. Would love to be able to offer that to your listeners too. And definitely connect with me at dranna.com. Thank you so much. To join the conversation on this topic, visit IFM's pages on Facebook and Instagram. For more information about functional medicine, visit ifm.org.